Welcome back to yet another episode of the BJJ Lab podcast. I'm here once again with Coach Jonas, and once again we talk about mental preparation for tournaments. Uh, like we had to wrap up the last two episodes relatively quick, so we thought we needed another one to get a little bit deeper into the topics, and uh, we'll get started right away. If you haven't seen the other ones, I really highly recommend you watch them in order, otherwise it might not make as much sense. So, um, the one thing we wanted to talk about it, um, like we talked about, was mental cues, but I think before that we should maybe even start with the why and the purpose. It might make more sense later than to get the cues, right? So, you want to start right away or should I? No, to? go ahead. So, basically it's really important that you know, like, why do you want to do the tournament? Like, why do you want to win? Why do you want to win a match? Like, do you even want to win? Like, why are you there? Like, if you understand that reason, then everything else will become a lot easier. And if you absolutely have no reason to be there, like, why did you sign up? <laughs> I guess that's another Maybe point. because Patrick made you? <laughs> <laughs> that's a good point. But uh, basically, you need to have a purpose there. And it might be because you really want to win gold, or it might just be because you want to experience a competition for the first time. But... I think it's important that deep inside you know why you're doing this. Yeah, I, uh, I agree. And um, winning a tournament uh, can be a really good goal. But uh, as, uh, as you maybe remember from the last podcast we made, um, you know, there is a lot of chaos. And uh, sometimes there are things you cannot control. You, I don't know, you might have an unfair referee or, or you know, you break a leg bef the day before. So it is, um, you know, it's the why and the purpose, it sort of helps you through the entire process. Because, you know, the competition itself, it's not only the competition. As we spoke, it, it consists of many, many things, the entire preparation. And, and it's the entire experience that actually makes you a better, better athlete and, you know, possibly even a better person. I think that's really, like, so I think it's important that the why and the purpose is not necessarily the same as a goal. Because goals should be something that's under your control, right? It does, if you set a goal that's, I don't know, if something really stupid, like we flip a coin and my goal is to get a hat, like it's totally out of my control. And if I get disappointed, if it lands on tails, like it's totally useless and you'll just get frustrated. You might be happy if you get it, but you'll be not happy if you don't get it. So that's separate. But the per, like you can still be there to, win or like I can still be here to get ahead on the coin but I also realize and understand that it's not something that's under my control but I can try to create the factors maybe not on the coin flip but at least on the tournament to create the best environment to make it happen and that's the things that are under my control so it's important that you see the difference like the why is not necessarily like if you say I want to win gold or like I'm here to win gold doesn't mean that you're going to get frustrated if you don't do it. Of course, you're not going to be happy, but it, it shouldn't be like your main goal. Yeah, man, I'm, and if you consistently keep on com competing and you're getting better then like with a coin flip at one point, the that, chances are that you're going to win that gold. That was actually going to be exactly my next point. Oh, so we're on damn, the same I'm line. Here. <laughs> no, it's perfect. Like we're thinking the same thing here. So like... If your purpose is to win gold, like don't just focus on one competition. Like, if you want to be the guy that wins tournaments, you have to do a lot of them. And since there is a lot of chaos and things you can't control, the chances get a lot higher of you winning the more you do and the more better you prepare. Like, all you can do is increase your chances. It's almost like, like I don't know. Let's say you play poker. You cannot control what cards you draw, but you can control how you play. And all you can do is increase the odds. And it's the same in BJJ. You have to understand that there's a lot of things that go on that are totally out of your control. You don't know who your opponent is. You don't know how good he is. You don't know what the referee feels on the day. He might just disqualify you for something that you didn't do wrong. I don't want to... Yeah, happened to me. <laughs> uh, I think it happened to you as well. Oh, no, it was the opposite way around. But anyway, like that, that's not the... I just want to say that like there's a lot of chaos and... All you can do is better the odds. And you have to understand that. And then it's also a lot easier to not get frustrated if something goes wrong. Yeah, absolutely. But you should get frustrated if something goes wrong that was under your control. If you're not making weight, that's on you. Like, 
that was totally under your control, I would say. No one forced you to eat that cake. <laughs> <laughs> very good, very good. Um, all right. So uh, you want to move on a little bit to the mental cues and talk a little bit about that? Yeah, certainly. So when I started getting ready for the competition, then I, uh, I also went through a couple of articles and, and videos um, on YouTube and um, I set the... I found this set of sort of like questions and things uh, you can ask yourself or you can you can tell yourself in order to bring yourself you know you know uh, what did you say before to align the the, the uh, like you know the butterflies or something uh, oh yeah make the butterflies fly in formation <laughs> exactly you know to 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 force the butterflies into the formation and it's it's uh, these are the mental mental cues and what they what they serve for what what their purpose is is to you know, to, to, to sort of, um, you know, to help you to control your mental state in a, like under pressure. And um, this could be very, very, very simple, such as, you know, calm, or uh, you can do this, or breathe. Because yeah, especially for what I was just about to say, like for white belts, it should be breathe. <laughs> yeah. uh, because, you know, like if you're there, you, you know, you, you have forgotten everything else and, and, you're, and, and your adrenaline is dumping and your grips are already dying. Then, if you remember to tell yourself, you know, to breathe, then at least you, you increase your chances of, you know, you know, surviving this round. Again, if you watch beginners in the first tournament, you would not believe how many times you see people like hold their own breath for no particular reason. Like, there might not even be in a bad spot. They're holding on, and you see like, <gasps> and they're getting red, and then suddenly their brain goes like, <gasps> <laughs> <laughs> but there's no reason for them to stop breathing. Yeah. So I think. That's a really good one. <laughs> yeah, and, and I mean, these are the things you can actually start uh, already practicing while in training. Because like after the technical part is over, you go, into, you go into sparring, then you just start telling yourself those things. You, sell, you, you tell yourself, breathe, you know, calm down. You don't need to, you don't need to prove anything here uh, you know, on the mat. You want to make your technique work. So you know, if you're calm, you have better chances that you see opportunities that you didn't before when you're just going you know, 120% during a friendly sparring round. So this is something you can already start with immediately. But you had a very good point about the, uh, the, the mental reset, or how did you know? Yeah, that's actually what I wanted to get into right away. So basically, you have those cues, and those are a couple words that bring you, like, what they should be at least, is they bring you to your ideal mental state. So when you visualize and whatever, you want to be in this state where you are most likely to perform as good as you can, like the ideal mental state. Like, what, Describe it. Um, and the cues are there to bring you back to that state. So, like if you forget to breathe, you tell yourself breathe so you can go back to that ideal mental state. If, for me, it might be like let your butterflies fly in formation. It's not something I would, it's a little bit long for a cue, but like the idea is the same that I come from the anxiety back to the excitement. And Basically, what you want to have is those mental cues, especially, like, it will be different for everyone on those areas where you personally struggle the most, where you are able to know that you're most likely to fail on the side and you have something to center you back. Mm -hmm. um, and ideally, it's a really short word, like Jonas said, like breathe or calm or... Or you can do it, you know. Just, yeah, there's something like that or, I don't know, um, I it might even be like, I can win this or... Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, in the end, it's, it might, it's yeah. just very personal. Like, whatever works for you. What, what, what is something that you're able to think about at any? any yeah. It might any even point? be the opposite, right? If you're someone that's really calm and you feel like you're not really like going as hard as you should or something, it might be. Yeah, come on, <laughs> like, come on, or like get mad, or. <laughs> yeah. it, it's really personal, but it should be. You should have a couple of those things to bring you back from to your ideal mental state, and if you know you're gonna drift off into this or this direct. Like think of it as a mountain and your ideal mental state is at the peak. And you can slide down into many different direction and depending on who you are, what you're like what kind of person you are, you're more likely to slide down either this side or the other side and you need something to get back up onto the top and it will be individual. I actually have a question for you Patrick. Um, what do you think about the, those competitors who uh, shout and scream and slap themselves and uh, because they're, I think they're, they're doing something similar, right? Yes, I would say so. Um, I'm not a big fan of those emotional 
showings in a tournament because to me it kind of shows you're not in control, but it, it might work for some people. Um, basically, it's a ritual to kind of get you into that state. That's, I would say it's even different from the queue, but it's also something we might want to talk about here. That's actually a good point. So before you start, you have to get yourself into that ideal mental state when you're ready, getting ready to compete. And again, that's something where visualization helps a lot, but you want to have like a set ritual. And um, one person to read up on this that's really well, I think, is Michael Phelps. He had like his really set routine, and I forgot how long it was, but I think it was over an hour that he went through before every competition, step by step. Everything exactly the same. Playing the same songs, doing the same amount of repetitions. And he did this for years and years, never changed a thing, and that got him into the perfect mental state. Now, the problem with this is, I mean, this is, I, of course, ideal if you can do it, but you might get really anxious if something goes wrong in your mental preparation. So I would not recommend having a whole hour, because maybe in swimming, it's like really predictable how the day goes. I don't know, I've never... I'm really bad at swimming and I've definitely never done a swimming competition. But at least in BJJ, the tournaments itself are really chaotic. So if you have a really set routine and you're not able to do it, you might, again, make it worse. So I think it's important that you have some kind of easy to do routine to get you into that mental state. But it should be something that's really easy to do again and that you can do quickly because I've messed up some tournaments where I was like getting ready, then oh no, you're like, they tell me you're on in like two hours. like. Then I go to the toilet, all right, I'll chill, like I'll warm up again, fresh. Then I walk back, I'm cold, and then they're like, you're on, like come to the mat. And like, I didn't even do my warm up and I had to compete right away. And actually they say like, it would be maybe beneficial if you have your longer routine that you can do if you have the time, but you should also have at least a short one to get you at least close to your ideal mental state if you have to. Sure, so it's like, um, you can probably then say that it is almost like a then it's like a mental mental warm up. So you yeah. because you said you know it might also th be physical. Th there's a physical warm up that, that you do. I've, I've seen you do. You know uh, in the warm up area, you have your own uh, uh, method for that, uh, and then you're doing something similar for your for your for your for your mental mental state. Yeah, I think the the getting ready part like the it should be even together. Like there's a physical aspect and a mental aspect and emotional and. Like it all plays together. Like the competition itself, you need all those different parts. I think your warm up should also contain something for each area to get you to the peak performance. Warming up your body, warming up your brain, warming up your emotions, warming up your techniques, get your timing on point. Like it's the whole picture is what counts. Do you think, um, so w w what do you think? Somebody that goes uh, to a competition for the first time, uh, you know what? What should it look like? It, it's because it's some, somehow it, it sounds very complex. I mean, yes. I mean, you can make it as complex as you want, but in the beginning, keep it as simple as possible. I would say. So, just get like a real short warm up ready to do. It might just be do some jumping jacks and squats. And I don't do much more for the physical warm up. Like a lot of times, you don't have a lot of space. You don't have mats. In the bigger tournaments, you might have mats which is good, then you can actually also do some BJJ to warm up, but you might not always have it. Just like have a real short set routine that you can go through mentally, maybe you listen to the same song, just stuff like that. And you, how you can practice is, is if you do it before training. If you come a little bit early, go through your routine, maybe not every day, but let's say you do an open mat, then you know you're gonna do comp prep, do your preparation for the competition prep as well. Get your routine going, and then you can recall that when you do the tournament. And again, it can be really simple when you start out. And it probably should be really simple. You don't want to be anxious because you mess up your routine. Like, that should not happen. Yeah, I can, I can definitely... <laughs> you shouldn't, go to, the, you shouldn't go, go to the competition without having, like, a warm-up routine. Because, like, when I, was, uh, when I was in Lausanne, I sort of had to, like, actively try to memorize how to do jumping jacks. Because I, ha <laughs> I hadn't done them for, like, 20 years. And, and, then, uh, and I needed to get uh, needed to get warm, and uh, I didn't have the chance of uh, of rolling uh, to, before the before the uh, match happened, and so I started doing jumping jumping checks that I hadn't done for, for yeah, the past you, twenty years. <laughs> Worse, you injure yourself in the warm up because you do something you haven't done in ten years. Yeah. <laughs> so it's definitely good to have some sort of a ritual ready. Um, yeah. Did, did you want to touch the, the just the, the topic of? Uh, of coal making as well? Yes, that would be the next one. Uh, Fantastic. 
you want to go into it? Or no, no, go ahead. So, like we mentioned that uh, you need this why and the purpose, but also like the goal is something that, like goal setting is something that also comes into it, but it, I think it plays a little bit on a higher level. It's not something that's specific for one tournament or, I mean, it shouldn't be in my opinion, because again, there's a lot of chaos. So goal, sell, goal setting definitely helps with uh, the whole why and the purpose, because then you will know why you're there, I would say. But uh, actually not sure what we want. To, like, maybe it's better if I give the word to you real quick and I'll gather my thoughts. Yeah. It's just that, um, like you know, you it's uh, it's gonna be easier when you have a like like a set goal, and I can I can just you know walk very very quickly through like the the, the process that I had before I went to the to my first competitions, and it was the following: um, I had to determine a goal that was sort of like you know doable. So I mean, my goal wasn't to win a gold medal, but it was to actually compete to take part of the like a like at least a couple of uh, competitions. And um, so this was this was my sort of my my clear goal to have. And then my second uh, second point was you know like why is it why is it purposeful like what are the benefits for me you know like what what does it why is it important for me why is it meaningful? And uh, you know I already we 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 touched that topic uh, already in the first pod podcast I think but you know I had to there there were things I had to overcome I had to overcome my fears. I had to feel like how it is because, you know, I'm teaching people. Um, I have to teach people that actually go into competition. And, you know, without experiencing, experiencing something like this yourself, it's really hard to, you know, explain somebody, you know, what they should expect. So that was uh, like, that's, that's why it was like, it was, it was meaningful for me. And then the third part is, you know, the, like, how do you schedule it? Like, what are the necessary steps for you to make in order to get there? And that was my training training plan with Patrick. That was, uh, you know, how we had scheduled our, you know, conditioning and everything. And then fourthly, I needed to have somebody to make me accountable. You know, to, you know, call me up and, and you know, make sure that I'm that I show up to training. And and that's how I that's how I build it up. That's that's like the short version of how how I did it. Is there anything you would add to that? Like what is important? No, I think that makes a lot of sense. Like again, like you. It comes a little bit back to the why and the purpose and having some goals behind it of course really helps like i'm a big big proponent of setting goals and i think jonas is as well um personally i've had really good experiences with making goals um i started doing it at i think 18 and i've doing it i've been doing it ever since regularly and it really really helped me achieve my goals as well and i think that's something we can go really in depth at some point in the future uh how we do it like and the benefits of it but um if you again, if you know why you're there, it will be a lot easier for you to perform, and uh, it helps you bring you back to uh, the actual thing. And I think this is a good segue now into how bad do you want it, and I think that's a topic you're well prepared to speak about. Uh, yeah. Um, so there's a book from uh, Mark Fitcherall, which is called "How Bad Do You Want It," and um, it talks about the. the life and competition exper experiences of uh, actually endurance athletes and um, I think it's fair to say that you know if uh, if you don't if you if you have already done some jiu-jitsu you, you see that it has to do a lot with endurance and 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 you also know that um, if you go for if, if if you train for hours in a row then you realize that in the end it's actually it's not your body giving up but it's 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 your mind and it is your mental states so once again, you should read the book, um, and and this is something actually where we where we found that connection with with Patrick when he was talking about uh, resetting your mental states. Then that was actually the question that I was always asking myself uh, in those competitions: How bad do I want it? You know, first of all, of course, it was already it was part of my uh, sort of my mental warm up. So that's what I was always always asking myself uh, when I was in the warm up area. Uh, and I was asking this before going to the mat and then also going into the competition. And it was especially helpful for me in the, in the positions uh, where I didn't know what to do for a second. I was like, it was sort of like, a, it was a scrambly thing, it was, it was chaos. Or when I felt stuck, if I was, uh, you know, somebody was in my close card, I wasn't able to submit them, I wasn't able to, uh, to sweep them. And I had to ask myself, how bad do I want it? And then I got more active because, you know, it, it happens a lot in a competition. You know, you are you are um, you're nervous. 
Uh, so you're trying to control the chaos by, you know, holding on to your partner and, you know, keeping them very close. But this actually sort of, uh, this takes a lot of opportunities away. So, so my question, how bad do you want it, actually made me move and, you know, made me do something that in the end actually, you know, brought some sort of success. So that's, some, that's one of the mental cues that I use. It's a little longer than the other one, like you know, the other ones like calm uh, or breathe and so on, but uh, it's a good one, especially if it's linked to, um, to this, uh, you know, this book. If you read through that, through that book, I'm, I'm, I'm certain that you're able to sort of somehow like um, this, this motivation resurfaces again, because if you read, read uh, like uh, what other athletes go through, I think it's very helpful. Yeah, I definitely agree. So I think it's like, I think the mental part of things is probably plays an even bigger role in endurance sports because, I mean, of course you have your capacity and if you're a lot fitter than the other guys, you will still outrun them. But if you're somewhat close and even if you're better than the other guy, but he really wants it, like that's something that was talked about in the book a lot, like he can push himself much closer to the limit by being willing to endure a lot more pain than the other person and surpass him, even though he's in a little bit worse physical shape. In BJJ, it's a little bit different because there's a big technical and tactical aspect to it as well, which might not always be there in endurance sports, or at least not as much. So it plays probably a little bit of a smaller role, but it's still really important because again, if you, have, if you break mentally, you're not gonna perform anymore as well as you could. That being said, it's just one part of the puzzle, and I remember a really good competitor, I forgot who it was, but at one point he mentioned that he went to a tournament and he was totally not there mentally, but he still won just because his body was executing everything that he was training to do. But that just means like he was making up for the lack of his mental state with even better technique and conditioning. But uh, for the mental part, that's definitely a really good cue. Um, it's also really important because let's say if I go compete at the Worlds, let's say I haven't done it yet, but uh, and I might get some kids from the favelas that for him it might be the ticket out of poverty. Like, let's just assume that. And then I come, I'm Swiss guy, relatively well off, don't have a, anything to worry about like that other guy, and then pretty much doing this for fun. Like right on paper, he wants it a lot more than me, and that's for sure. And if I don't know why I'm there, why I want to win, it's really easy to like not have the same drive as that other guy. So it's really important that if I'm doing if I'm doing that, I need to know like why do I want to win this and what am I willing to do? Because I know that other guy is not gonna have the problem of knowing what like he knows why he's there and he's, yeah. he's there to win, and I should be there too. Otherwise, I already started a really big disadvantage. Yeah. And in the end, I mean, like, if you, if you look at competition, then competition has, you, know, you have belt classes, you have belts, you have weight classes, um, it is also divided by gender, it's uh, age classes and everything. So, like, I mean, the, the organization that you're competing in, they're already doing a lot to sort of, you know, narrow down your skill set and what you're able, like, what, what you're capable of, uh, of doing physically. So, every little thing you know, that gives you this little, uh, like a little, that gives you a little bit of an advantage in the end pays off because uh, you're, you're, you know, if, if you're very, if, if your partner is as, as good as you are, or let's say they might be able to win you, you know, against you, you know, during training, but you are that kid from favelas, then, you know, you have that why, you have that purpose, you have that reason. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. So... I think we went over most things. Um, one thing I wanted to touch on real quick is um, a way how we prepare a little bit in training, at least sometimes. Um, one of our secrets. So hopefully none of our competitors are watching this podcast. Um, like it's really hard to recreate the feeling and the anxiety of a real tournament, but we try to get as close as possible uh, during some competition preparations at least. So I've seen, I've trained at different gyms. I've been to uh, competition classes at really good schools like the Kaiter Academy. And I've learned some things at work and I think we also come up with our own little spin on things that we make it work really well. So one is of course you have a separate competition class where people go to roll really hard, that's pretty obvious. 
Um, and then what you can do to create is as much anxiety as possible is of course having uh, some fake matches, even with a referee, where other people are watching you. For a lot of people that already gets them a lot more nervous than a regular sparring session, for sure. Uh, you can film yourself, that might add a little bit as well, might not, depending on the person. And uh, what I've seen a lot of people do is like close the windows, make it humid, hot. Good point, I think. I mean, you shouldn't make it wor like much worse than a tournament. It should be like a tournament. So if you're living, I don't know, in California and it's already really hot, like <laughs> keep it reasonable. <laughs> like, yeah. let's say you can make it a little bit worse, but like if it's that hot that you can't train efficiently, then it's not really yeah. purposeful. Or it gets uh, like um, it's actually dangerous. Yeah, it might be dangerous as well. Yeah, stay hydrated. Like oh, yeah. you just want to recreate the tournament experience as much as possible. And now the big part is the noise. And I think that's our own spin that I haven't seen anyone else do yet. Um, basically, we let some uh, stream from a IBJJF tournament or something play in the background. Just put it on speaker and make it really loud. And then you start feeling like you're there. And it might not sound like much. If you haven't done it, you're like, yeah, whatever. If you've started rolling hard with someone while someone, people are watching you and you hear that noise, especially if you've competed before, that adrenaline comes back. And that's, I think everyone has really, uh, I wouldn't say enjoy it, but uh, felt like they benefited from it. it. It's definitely stressful. It's not like a tournament situation, but it's, so far, it's as close as we've gotten to, I would say. Yeah, like the first time, I, first, first time we did it, uh, I must say it was a, it was a, like a shocker because I didn't know that we're going to do that. <laughs> 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 but uh, but um, now, in um, hindsight, it it was actually very close to the competition because we were like um, suddenly we're going at comp competition pace. I hear people screaming. It's really hot. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it was actually pretty close, uh, pretty close to uh, the the real thing. So if you're a coach, like don't tell your students that you're going to do it. Just surprise them. Makes it even exactly. work better. <laughs> yeah. And actually, something um, um, I felt that I need to say. I think uh, we're going to run out of time soon. But uh, uh, before we go, um, there's a very common um, fear it seems that people have, which is um, like. Um, you know, it's like a stage uh, stage fright, and and now I can talk about my own personal uh, experience, but I've also asked some other people, and what I figured was that after I like after you you actually step on that mat, you you don't see the other people, you don't hear the other people, and uh, what you thought uh, you know you know I think people tend to think that you know the entire crowd is you know looking at you and. And you know what you're doing, and 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 so on. Like, don't worry about that. This is you. You don't have time to, to concentrate on that at all. And like all the other competitors that I asked that question, uh, if they feel you know sort of put on spot or something like this, they said no. They... Yeah, I think it's not like you're. You'll be lucky if you're able to hear your coach. Yeah, sure. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. if you have the mental capacity to at least like that's already hard to do sometimes. Yeah. So. There's a lot of other stuff going on that you won't notice. So if what I like, I think that the point that I was trying to actually uh, convey is uh, like if you think that this is this might be one of the reasons why you don't want to you, you don't want to compete, then yeah, you should not be afraid of that. That's that should definitely be the reason why you're not competing. All right, sounds like a good point to wrap it up. Thank you very much, Jonas. And, good to be uh, here. See you next time.